So hi everyone and welcome to this video on non-stationary data. So as we mentioned uh, over the course of time series econometrics, we said that an ideal characteristic of most uh, models is that the series that we're going to be dealing with should be stationary. And that's because dealing with non-stationary data could imply that uh, the, the past values of the time series could have a non-declining effect on the future and the current values of the time series. And that would be quite restrictive from an analysis standpoint. So uh, let's try to relax it a bit, but also just define what non-stationarity is, right? So our assumption that we've had, which is of weak stationarity, tends to be quite restrictive. And the thing is, if that assumption doesn't hold, then the series is said to be non-stationary. So if you recall, we have two types of stationarity, that's weak and strict. Now, if weak doesn't hold, then it appears that the series is non-stationary. Now, in a non-stationary series, there is no long-run mean to, we, to which the series will sort of converge to or returns to, in a sense. And in a sense, econom uh, econometrically, and I think economically, there is no steady state. And from an economic aspect, we do believe that some variables have a long-run equilibrium concept and that that concept of a long-run equilibrium is crucial into the analysis as we'll see when we get to error corrections. And moreover, the variable is time dependent if it is non-stationary, i.e. if you pass through time, there is a, some dependency between the raw series itself and just the passage of time. Therefore, essentially, it could go on to infinity and as a result, the autocorrelation coefficients, uh, those ACFs, don't necessarily decay. And it doesn't adhere to the properties that we observe with the AR and the MA models. Now, let's get on to what stochastic non-stationarity is. So a process can have what we refer to as a random trend. So it can have this random trend, and that random trend is random, and it varies over time. And the classical example of this would be of a simple non-stationary time series, uh, which is stochastic, is a simple random walk model, which is yt is equal to yt minus 1 plus ut. Note that in here, we are implicitly assuming that the value of phi is equal to 1, right? Because the coefficient of yt here is just equal to 1, right? So. Uh, of a phi one, that, that's uh, a phi one that's equal to one. So the random walk is in essence an AR model, wherein the coefficient of the lag term, because we just use one lag, is equal to one, right? Moreover, we can sort of modify this model into a simple random walk with a drift parameter, which is we add this mu term here. So a simple random walk is just yt, is equal to yt minus one plus ut. When we add a drift, we just basically add the mu parameter, which is your drift parameter, plus yt minus one plus ut, right? So here we have uh, it graphically, so you can see the random walk. And here, this is different with trend here, so meaning there's some time dependency over there. And you can have a certain drift wherein this series may go up slightly and then start to trend down and so on. So that's just an example of it graphically. And you can see the different types of non-stationary series here. So recall that in any AR1 model, the theta one coefficient is the first uh, is the coefficient associated with the first lag value. And the thing is, when theta one is greater than one, it's not typically encountered in economics because we think that the immediate past doesn't necessarily go over and above uh, one to define what today is, right? It's a proportion of what today is likely, meaning less than one, but it's not like gonna be greater than one. And the thing is when we estimate the theta, uh, uh, sorry, a phi greater than one, then it sort of imputes an explosive function. And that doesn't necessarily characterize a lot of the macro time series we've been accustomed to. However, uh, uh, while greater than one is rarely encountered, theta, uh, sorry, phi equal to one is uh, relatively common. So it characterizes a lot of time series. So 
having a non-stationary time series and forecasting using the raw series has a lot of consequences. And one of the main consequences is that shocks don't decay, but they're persistent throughout time. So when a shock happens, they sort of propagate themselves, even though the shock happened so long ago. So the shock is persistent through time and keep making themselves known, even though a long time or a substantial period of time had elapsed. Not only that, not only are they persistent, they are also propagated so that a shock uh, may have an increasingly larger effect or influence on current time periods than it did initially, which is highly improbable. You would expect, say, a shock like a crisis event to have its immediate impact near the crisis or a little bit lagged after the crisis, but not its biggest impact after, way after the crisis itself. Right? So that's a consequence of dealing with non-stationary data. So just to see a proof of it, consider our AR1 model with no drift. So in here, we don't uh, assume that phi is equal to one. So if we lag the value of yt by two periods, so from here, this is your original model, right? yt minus one plus ut. If we lag it by two periods, so that's just the first lag is yt minus one equal to phi one yt minus two plus ut minus one. So that's the first lag. And your second lag would be y t minus two is equal to phi one, y t minus three plus u t minus two. And that's your second lag, right? That's how to get it. Again, you're just moving from this period, lagging it more. Now you can substitute essentially this uh, equation, right, into here, right? So in that way, this becomes y t is equal to phi one or phi rather, just the phi, uh, times uh, y t, uh, sorry, sorry, times um, phi y t minus two plus u t minus one, right? So you can substitute that. And in effect, you could substitute this equation in here as well. So you can keep on substituting for as long as you'd like, right? So Substituting it on and on gives you the reformulated AR model, which ends up being here. So you can see that you now get phi terms, which are cubed squared, depending on how many times you resubstitute it into the equation. And if you iterate over subsequent lags, you get this expression here, right? So from the last slide, essentially, one way to look at the present value of today is just sort of like the sum, right, is the sum uh, of the association between it and its very first value, right? So uh, that's one way to see sort of how these things are linked up. And if you'd like to see what that means or what that translates to, kindly see my video on Wall's decomposition theory. So essentially, uh, one way to look at the present value of y, uh, which is y t, is just the association between that present value and its very first value, plus the sum of the errors that came between those two time periods. The very first one and the one you have now, so that's just the initial value of y added to whatever errors uh, happened in the middle. And the sum of that plus the initial value of y would just be equal to y today, right? So. There are three general cases that we can deduce from this equation. One is that if phi is less than one, this suggests that the subsequent phi's approach zero as the number of periods away, right? so as t goes to infinity. And in this case, the effect of a shock diminishes as time elapses. This is quite normal, and this is the behavior we'd like to expect. Right? Because as you move through time, you should expect that the phi's tend to go down, right? Now, if you find that the phi is equal to one, then it suggests that phi t, right, at any time period is equal to one. This suggests that the effects persist and that shocks have equal weights and the variance grows indefinitely. So how does that translate to anything, right? Well, in essence, the current value of y, which is our dependent variable, variable is merely an infinite uh, sum, basically the definition we discussed earlier, of the past shocks plus its initial value. So if I add the initial value of y at time period one and added the shocks in between, I would get the current value of y. 
And we call this the unit root case for the root of the characteristic equation basically would be uh, one, right? Would be unity. And we discussed this in the previous section. And if phi is greater than one, as we said, then shocks become more influential over time. Ergo, this is what you refer to as an explosive case. So one way for us to sort of accommodate non-stationary series is to just difference, right? So if you uh, sort of want to stationarize a series, of course, the main process by which we do this, is we want to uh, difference the series and that could alleviate the non-stationary. So if you look at our model, which is a random walk with drift, so you have, again, this is your drift parameter, your drift parameter, and then you have yt minus one, which is the first lag, and its coefficient is equal to one, i.e. imputing a random walk plus some error term. So you find that in this random walk with drift, there is some stochastic trend in the data. And one way we can alleviate the non-stationary nature of it is through differencing. And we define differencing as just the change in y. So if I subtract the, the past value from the present value, that's the difference of yt, somewhat like a growth or a change parameter, I guess. So if you manipulate the random walk with drift, again, that's just equal to mu plus uh, yt minus one plus ut. If I manipulate that, so I transpose yt minus one to the other side, yt minus one, that's equal to mu plus ut. But remember, I can write this in lag order operation, which is just remember if I lag it once, that's just L. So one minus L times yt, because I didn't lag this term, this term here is lag, right? And that's equal to the drift parameter plus ut. Then effectively this thing as well is equal to the change in yt and that's equal to mu plus ut. And what you'll notice is that you remove that phi coefficient and this new variable is in effect a stationary series because it's just the drift plus some white noise error term. Moreover, the stationarity has been induced when the differencing had taken place. And uh, readers should just note that the representation, which is this one, is what we refer to as a unit root process. That is trying to derive the root of the characteristic equation, which would be basically when we do this one minus Z, you'd find that the root is equal to one, which imputes a non-stationary series at that level, right? So um, this is just a further proof in another case. So we have, um, a trend stationary process in this case. So we have now uh, a beta term, which is time dependent. So that's where the trend comes in. A trend stationary process sort of looks like this. And note that if we assume that ut is some white noise error term. So for example, we have this uh, term here. So you get this uh, uh, model here. Essentially, the process would be your typical stationary model because first and foremost, we find that our phi is less than one. And remember, phi is equal to one is the sort of benchmark for non-stationarity, except that we have some linear trend, which is this one, which is sort of introducing the station, the non-stationarity part of it. The model would have been stationary had this not been there, but um, it's not because that linear trend is there. And to be able to stationarize a series like this, we would need to detrend the series or maybe potentially just difference it. So this is a, basically a graphical representation. If you have an AR1 model with a deterministic trend, i.e. that's that beta t term there, then it just goes up in time, dependent on time. But if we difference it, it becomes more a stationary series. So you see that the mean is now roughly equal to zero. So that's our lecture on non-stationarity and differencing. And uh, in the next video, we're going to discuss more on, well, what are the consequences of non-stationarity? So thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video.